Hey, happy month of Bazaar, day one. I'm very excited, but also very nervous because not only is this the first time I've ever like helmed anything like this, it's also a subject that I need to really work on. Uh, opening lines, it's arguably one of the most important pieces of a show or a set, and I am I'm not super great at it. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, uh, especially when it's a place like the Magic Castle where you know, people of varying levels of drunk just came out of a fun show and they enter a basement and they just go, why is this scary Filipino ghost telling ghost stories? It's really bringing my mood down. But this whole month is about stepping out of our comfort zone. So even if I improve a little bit, uh, I feel that's a success. Opening lines found in the attic. When I start a new project, I think what helps me get stuff done fast enough is setting reasonable goals for what I'm trying to accomplish. And I think the first goal that I like to lean into whenever I start a new piece is I like story over mechanics. I believe that we're entertainers first and magicians second. One of my biggest pet peeves in magic is this idea of putting so much time and effort into how something works, but not putting as much effort into the scripting process or telling a story. Now, I'm not saying that technique doesn't matter. If the audience thinks you don't know what you're doing, they're not going to be entertained. What I am saying is that there's a difference between me doing this and me explaining the history of the trap, uh, the mechanism of how it works, how I'm able to do this, and how dangerous it is and how you should not try this at home. Please, seriously, do not try this at home, thanks. So my next goal is something that I struggle with. Uh, this idea that the opener needs to be visual, but it also needs to set expectations. The visual part should be easy enough to understand. Every show needs a hook to get the audience invested in what you're doing on stage. Unfortunately, the easiest, most accessible way to do this is with something highly visual. It got your attention when I stuck my hand in this trap, right? I mean, it's kind of hard not to turn some heads with something like this, especially if it's not really expected. The trap itself also helps set expectations in two important ways. Number one, it lets them know that this is not the type of show most people are used to. And number two, it tells them, one, you're gonna be working with some really weird shit. Number two, that weird shit needs some explanations. And number three, it helps set the format of you telling a story around what you're presenting. The final goals I have for these opening lines are the most important in any piece of Bizarre Magic. Setting theme and setting atmosphere. Super Eyepatch Wolf has an amazing video on the game Devotion that you should absolutely check out. But after watching it last night for the first time, I fell in love with the term domestic horror. Domestic horror is the idea of, well, you could live in a nice suburban neighborhood, but just below the surface level, there is nothing but nightmare fuel. So we are gonna find this inside of an attic. We have to answer the who, what, when, where, whys, and hows. And I think the easiest way for us to set up the themes and atmosphere of domestic horror is the line, every family has skeletons in the closet. Hours are kept inside the attic. So already we have so much to work on. Tomorrow we're gonna work on fleshing out the line and maybe even get some drafts in. Hey, happy month of Bazaar, day number two. Yesterday we figured out our goals for the animal trap. Today we're gonna figure out the details to put around the animal trap. The simplest way to figure out the details or to answer the who, what, when, where, whys, and hows of the story. Who is in the story, not just the characters, but also who is the narrator? What is the story about? Which we'll get to, because that's pretty hard. When does the story take place? Where does the story take place? Why should the audience care? And how are you going to convince them to care? So what's great about these questions is that you don't have to answer them from top to bottom of that list. You can actually answer the questions that are easiest first and that will help us guide the way to finishing. When it comes to answering these questions, I think where we should start is the who of the story. We already have a few important roles figured out. I'm gonna be telling the story. The main character in that story is gonna be, again, this ugly mug. So we just have to figure out who the trap belongs to. 
When it comes to domestic horror, the idea of family being unsafe is a strong one. Uh, even with something like Hereditary, the cult stuff is less scary than a family falling apart due to madness. Let's avert some cliches though. So we're gonna stay away from immediate family, so that's parents and siblings, and instead let's focus on extended family, the aunts, the uncles, and the cousins. That way you have that familiar sense of family, but it's distant enough to where maybe you don't see your extended family often enough besides holidays, weddings, and funerals. So we're gonna do two questions at once because they do feed into each other. We know for a fact that we need to find the trap inside of the attic, but we need to figure out when would we be inside of said attic. If we only see extended family at holidays, weddings, and funerals, I feel like the most reasonable reason for us to be in the attic is to help clear up some stuff after a family member has passed. And because I'm a millennial who will never own real estate, let's say that the attic has way too much stuff in it and that the cousin I'm helping is about to be kicked out because the bank foreclosed on the house. So now that we have the where mostly figured out, at least for a first draft, uh, we can use the when part to explain the time frame of which this takes place. So for the sake of the story, let's say that my cousin, it took a while for them to come to terms with what had happened, so now they are frantically trying to move out before the bank gets physical. And now we get to the hard ones. We're gonna start with the why. Uh, why should the audience care about any of this? Good storytelling is a machine that has a lot of moving parts, but I would say one of the key mechanisms that make good storytelling is the idea of empathy. We've all felt grief for someone who had passed away. Uh, maybe don't focus on my grief, but my cousin's grief instead. So we could also have empathy towards evictions because, oh boy, 2020. Uh, that shit's fucking rough. But also, the why is the idea of a family keeping secrets from the younger members for quote-unquote protection. Empathy is the main mechanism here. If the audience can relate to what's happening within the story, it will be much more impactful and much more terrifying. So, now we have to focus on how we're going to make the audience feel why these things matter. And I think we're gonna go back to our first goal and focus on the script. Tomorrow we'll focus on actually writing the script. As for now, let's just say that the script is gonna be the main component of making the audience care. So next we gotta focus on acting. Now, I'm not a good actor by any means. Whenever I'm on stage, I have three types of characters. I have the lovable goofball, I have the silent monster of Sand Demon, and then I also have the Rod Serling style weird, man of mystery shit. Uh, that seems to work really well for this sort of thing. Last but not least, if we have a solid script and decent acting, up next we need to focus on engagement. Engagement is so important that it's gonna get its own video. When I said engagement needed its own video, I might have to make at least one more to cover everything I want to say. Basically, if you want something to be engaging, you should try and play into the five basic senses. Sight is going to be easiest to explain. Let's start there. It's what the audience sees on the stage. So it's your costuming, it's your props, it's your stage dressing, but also things like body language and how you are conveying the information indirectly. Sound is a lot more than just going on stage and saying what's on the script. It's focusing on speech mainly conversation between characters, how loud the words are on stage, something I definitely need to work on because I tend to whisper when telling ghost stories. Is music involved? If so, focus on the levels. And most importantly, pacing. Oh God, let's focus on pacing, please. So for touch, it helps if the audience handles the trap. The thing is, this animal trap is very dangerous. You need to be very careful when letting the audience examine this because let me tell you, if someone gets hurt, it's 100% on you. How you can get around the audience being in any real danger is the idea of, hey, these parts of the routine are safe to hand out the prop and then when the prop is live and dangerous, it's 100% only in your hands. So while this would fall under scripting, I think it's always a good idea to expand the point of view 
in that script. And something that doesn't really get brought up is taste and smell. You really only need one or two lines here. How did the food at the wake taste? How did leftovers smell now? Are there dirty dishes and garbage everywhere? Cigarette smoke because fuck it, you're not getting your safety deposit back. And how does a shot of whiskey taste with solidarity uh, to your cousin? Now the hardest question to answer, what? What is this story about? I can already hear comments saying, it's about a fucking animal trap in an attic. Read this prompt. But I don't mean what is the plot about. I mean, what is the actual story trying to say? So we know for a fact we're working with domestic horror. Let's expand on the theme that you never really know what the other person is thinking in your life, even family. And also, let's focus on a dark secret kept inside of the attic that should not have been found. So I'm gonna say this story is about monsters coming in all shapes and sizes, uh, including family men and respected members of the community. If that sounds unoriginal, let me tell you, there's no original idea. What is original is how we take our experiences, we rework the idea, and how the audience perceives said idea. So just from these two days alone, we've figured out a ton to start the scripting process. And I know it seems like a lot, but the more we have this stuff planned ahead of time, the less guesswork we have to do. So we have a dark secret that is revealed through death, an animal trap, and an attic. We have the idea of lending a hand to a grieving cousin, uh, just because, you know, you could foreshadow the trap later. Uh, domestic horror, monsters come in all shapes and sizes. And with that, we're gonna set the atmosphere, theme, and expectations. Tomorrow we're going to work on actually writing the script and hopefully just get the first draft of the introduction done for the routine. See you soon. Hey, happy month of Bazaar, day number three. Today we're going to work on the actual writing process for the opening line found in the attic. But Daniel, I've never even written a magic script before. I usually just riff on stage. Like, like, a, like a magician. Well, Steve Buscemi, there's certainly nothing wrong with that, but... In my opinion, keeping your script and story cohesive is going to make sure your audience doesn't check out. So, let's get started. All right, we have one goal today, and only one goal. It's going to be a lot easier if we break this into steps. Basically, we need to finish the first draft of the opening lines of this routine. So for most of 2020, I've applied these three steps to the scripts and projects I've been writing. And uh, it's definitely helped speed things along, especially when I have a complete outline. So trade secrets, follow me on Patreon. Kintsugi is going to take the longest to explain, but I think it's going to help us the most. Basically, it's my reinterpretation of the three act structure. Four corners will have our four key points of the entire story and how they interact with each other. That way we have clear relationships and motivations for each one. And adjust is really just adjusting things after we have those two processes figured out. This process, it works really well for magic scripts, but in my opinion, you can apply this to any type of writing and it should be just as effective. I first heard about Kintsugi in a nerd writer video essay six years ago. Only very recently did I realize that, holy shit, that is story structure. Check out the nerd writer video for a more in-depth analysis of the story. But basically the TLDR is that a Shogun broke his favorite bowl. He sent it away for repairs when it came back. It wasn't really fixed, it just had staples in it. So he asked a craftsman, can you make this more elegant? And when he got it back, all of the broken pieces were mended with gold. So I think Kintsugi works for story structure because of three main elements. The first being that there are distinct phases that are tied to action. Number two, there's a push and pull with conflict. And number three, all of the pieces must come together at the very end. I've adjusted the phases, so now the four parts of the structure are going to be breaking the bowl, taping the bowl, gluing the bowl, and kintsugi. All right, breaking the bowl. Basically, the inciting incident of the story that kicks everything off. My uncle dies, I need to help my cousin move. Pretty straightforward. All right, taping the bowl. Basically, the first step in trying to fix the problem. Uh, it's checking in on my cousin, seeing he's sad, us drinking shots together, and me trying to comfort him and honestly doing a pretty shitty job. Gluing the bowl. Obviously the tape was a temporary fix at best. The glue is gonna be more of a push towards figuring out the best way to end it. Uh, so we're gonna to head to the attic and that's where we're gonna find the trap and the horror of the story. 
And the last phase is Kintsugi, taking all of the parts and elements that we had before the ending and making sure that they all tie together. If you have a piece of your story that doesn't fit perfectly with everything else, it shouldn't be there. We can't afford any loose ends. When you were in school learning basic story structure, it probably looked like this. Uh, a line going straight up, a peak at the very top, and then it goes down a little bit for a resolve. Basically, the three-act structure. What makes Kintsugi great is this idea of the line still goes up, but there are dips that immediately react to the step before it. Matt Stone and Trey Parker have a piece of advice where if you could fit the word and then between your story beats, it's going to be boring. Instead, what they suggest is using the words therefore or but between those story beats to make it more dynamic. So not only are these four phases directly tied to action, but there are also responses to the previous action before it. And since we did a good job outlining what we wanted to accomplish, now we just have to do the mechanical part of writing. So we have me, we have my cousin, we have the audience, and then we have the horror. Now you're going to connect two lines per corner to the other remaining corners. So this would be me to my cousin, me to the horror, and me to the audience. Do that for the rest of the corners and you're going to have something that looks like an X-Men belt buckle. I'm not going to do all four corners, but I am going to speed line this. I want to help my cousin because he's grieving and because he's family. My cousin's relationship back to me is that they feel alone, so any help is much appreciated. My relationship to the horror is that I'm not expecting it, so I need to try and get the fuck out of there. The relationship of the horror in me is that it wants me dead. And my relationship to the audience, the information I'm trying to convey, is... I'd just like to say, this is just Tuesday for me. It's not anything too special. The audience's relationship to me is that they will want to watch more of what I'm doing because this is just a fucking Tuesday for you? What? Despite drinking hard liquor from a coffee mug, I'm not an English teacher. I can't teach you how to put one word in front of the other and make it sound good. The advice I would give you is... Do not be afraid to indulge in genre. I would rather see a performer on stage talk about how his trip home from buying cigarettes or going through the nine circles of hell than see the same hack joke shit say, you know, you should never play cards with a magician. I'm a master gambler. Like, no, you're not. I'm sorry, you're just not. No, no one believes you. And also, I'm not invested in this show at all anymore because I don't believe you and it's not interesting. If your audience sees you on stage sincerely talking about yourself, about the people in the story, about what happened, why you were terrified, and also they see that you were sincerely conveying that information with heart, their suspension of disbelief will be on your side. I was bleeding, rust entering my bloodstream, the taste of cheap scotch and cheaper smoke singeing my tongue when I realized I fell into the trap. The chitter-chatter of small, dark creatures sounded like a body being reduced to ash. It was familiar. That made it devastating. Every family has skeletons in the closets. We keep ours in the attic. Not bad, right? At the first draft, obviously, and it needs work, we also need the rest of the story to figure things out. But I hope me showing you this process has demystified the whole building a script for an effect, because this is what they're gonna remember. No one will ever remember any of the technical things you do in a show. They will only remember what they see, what they hear, and how they feel.